Well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements Diagnostics Webinar Series. This one is Plant Healthcare, the Diagnostic Process for Spring. And just by way of introduction, I'm Kent Honnell, Arborologist for Rainbow Tree Care and Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements. I've been working in arboriculture for Rainbow Tree Care and Rainbow Tr Companies since 1994. And we're based out of Minnetonka, Minnesota in the US and we're performing technical training and research projects. That's really the purview of arborologist. And the aim is to merge science and practical application, which is what I'll be sharing today with the process I've developed for going through diagnostics on the tree conditions in our field. I'm a board certified master arborist with the ISA and also track certified from International Society of Arboriculture. Additionally, I serve as a adjunct faculty at Hennepin Technical College in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. I've been doing that since 2014, and that's a lot of fun. Our objectives today in this webinar will be taking a look at how we can have a systematic approach to tree diagnostics, take some of the fear and uh, mental paralysis out of, gosh, what do I do? Um, there's so much out there to learn and come out with an accurate diagnosis. If there's a systematic approach, it takes some of that uh, fear out of it. And a big part of this also is accurate tree identification. You have to know what your trees are accurately first if you wanna know what possible conditions will affect them. And then we'll move on to patterns in tree diseases. And an important distinction will be to look for the difference between signs and symptoms. That sounds like almost the same word, but there's an important difference there that we'll be getting to. And just with a few really basic tools, you can do quite a bit with diagnostics. So we'll look at uh, just a, a little bit of some tools that you can add to your kit if you don't have them already. So one of the first resources I point to is great stuff out of extension services throughout the country. And this is from Ohio State University. There's Joe Boggs working for Ohio State has this document called the 20 questions on plant diagnosis. It's something that I go back to every season at the beginning just to review because it's so thorough. And it's based on a set of questions to ask of yourself or of the site or what's going on. So you can use this as kind of like a review of the fundamentals that are a checklist for yourself. And if I'm just kind of continuing along this line, if we just look at the first four of the 20 questions, you know, I don't want to do the whole webinar just on Joe Boggs's document, but starting with the first four, that would be what is the plant and what's normal for the plant. What are the common problems of the plant? And what do you see that looks abnormal? So really four basic questions as a starting point. And what is the plant points to getting the identification accurate from the very beginning? So that's why the point to this, question one, what is the plant? Because you'll focus the diagnosis much better if you have a proper identification. And I'm pointing out here, looking at the cones on conifers will be a night and day difference and really help you out in situations like this one where sometimes the idea is really tricky. I was lo looking at this tree thinking, well, the color and the branching habit makes it look more like a Norway spruce. It's not a Colorado, I thought, because the color wasn't bluish. But then I looked at the cones and the cones looked like they were the long, tan colored ones and not like the big long extending six to nine inch ones like on a Norway spruce. So as it turns out, it's a Colorado green. You know, you'll get some color variations and some of the structural uh, shapes will differ here and there. But if you verify it by the cones, uh, that's how, you know, dial that in with your conifers and you'll really have a lot easier time of it with some of these tricky ones. For example, Douglas fir with those little serpent tongue things coming out of the cone scales 
look really different from a Norway spruce cone, for example. So, you know, get to know the cones that are dropped under that tree, not ones kind of carried over by squirrels from a neighboring tree, but the ones that you can either see on the tree or the ones that have fallen right under the base of it for your conifers are very distinctive and very helpful. Then question two, out of those first four that we looked at, what is normal for the plant? You know, over time, you'll get to know what's a normal profile of things that you'll see during the course of a season as the season changes or what's characteristic to that species. And maybe you get called out by a client who's wondering, why are these weird little red lumpy things growing on the spruce tree here? And is this a disease? Is it a gall formation from some insect or a mite? But actually that's just part of the normal spring cycle in your spring diagnostics as that's the flower of the tree. And many times the conifers will be shedding huge amounts of pollen too. You can just see the clouds of yellow pollen as you shake a branch. But I've had clients insist that something's wrong with the tree because they have these little weird red galls forming on there. But you can let them know that this is just part of the normal cycle for that plant is the flowering. And what is normal for the plant? Sometimes there's cultivars that have different colorations. You might think it's chlorosis if you're not familiar with that variety. Now, the great thing nowadays, you can take a picture with your phone and go to your local nursery garden center and say, is there some variety that you have of you that has this kind of foliage to it? And that's what I did when I first came across bright gold U. I brought it to our uh, big nursery representatives here in the Twin Cities area, and they told me about bright gold U. So I didn't have to worry about that being chlorosis on the U. That's just the normal. Uh, representation of that variety. But the spruce needle yellowing on the left here, you can see how that doesn't look like something that would be consistent through the needles like a, a varietal difference. That's something more like banded through different ages of the growth on that. So this turns out something more like a manganese or some kind of mineral deficiency in, in that particular tree. Because if you understand the biology and what's normal or abnormal for the tree, then typically that will sort of fold into understanding the diagnostics for a condition. And that will also feed right into understanding the management. They all sort of nest together once you know the biology of that disease. And here's where my process starts is at the base. And I've learned this over time to start my diagnosis at the base of the tree, just as a consistent starting point. And there's reasons behind that, how I've learned to follow that process. Because you know, if you start from the base, you're gonna examine the whole tree from the ground upward and check for issues with root flare infections or injury. What's the soil quality? Do you have girdling roots? Because any of those other things could render treatments up in the crown useless. You know, if you start looking up in the crown and diagnosing what you think's going on and maybe even cut samples and verify what you think's going on in the upper part of the tree, your therapy might involve injections or something that are not going to be viable because of girdling roots or damaged root flare issues or some kind of infection of that tissue that will not even make it possible to treat what's going on. And this is happened to me before in my earlier days, and I just resolved to always start my diagnostic process working from the base upwards because of that. Because, you know, if you're trying to hook up an elm or an oak or some kind of tree for a macro infusion or some kind of an injectable therapy, it's not really going to work that well if that trunk tissue is damaged or root flare tissue is damaged that you're not gonna get distribution or uptake of product evenly throughout the crown. So here's where I will always do this thump test that I just call it the thump test where you learn to identify a kind of mushy sounding or dead patches of bark around the root flare. And it'll help you identify whether it's decay or other infection. 
and this is where we could patch in a little video where I'm showing, I, I don't have necessarily the rubber mallet, but even the back end of your knife handle that you should have in your pocket all the time, that can be a good starting point to just thump it with the back end of your knife. Because one of the main culprits we would be looking for during a thump test would be this uh, armillaria root rot, which is a root invading fungus with a worldwide distribution. It can be a saprophyte or a parasite, which means a saprophyte uh, feeding on dead material. Like it could just be decaying a stump of a tree that's been there a long time. But it's also a parasite meaning it can be a disease organism that's undermining the life of the cambium and feeding on the stored carbohydrates in sapwood. So most disease fungi are just working on one aspect as a disease organism. They're a vascular fungus or a foliar fungus or something, you know, just a disease. They're not also decaying. Usually fungi are pretty specialized, but this has a broad role as both of those decay and disease organism and a really wide host range too like just about any woody plant that this decides it wants to invade it can do so so if you're thumping around the base of the tree and you hear feel some kind of mushy sounding patch you can peel off a chunk of bark there'll be this white flat fan shaped kind of growth under the bark that's called the mycelium the mycelial fan when it's in its active growing state. And by that point, the top of the tree is starting to look like there's decline in it as well, because that part of the conduction to the root system has been disrupted. In its more advanced stage where the tree is probably completely dead and you peel off that bark, it will have sort of retreated into this stage where it's kind of a resting state. They call it the rhizomorph or these black shoe stringy things that are underneath the bark. And the fruiting body or the mushroom that it makes is honey colored usually and right on or near the root flare or close to it. And if you see stuff like that, these sort of orange honey colored mushrooms, but they're further out in mulch, there's some other thing called a jack-o'-lantern mushroom. So you don't need to mistake it for that. Armillaria will be on an affected tree right on the root flare. But this is one of the early things you wanna be able to rule out. You know, if you're trying to work with a tree and it's got armillaria on it, chances are that that's a removal. It's not something that you're going to succeed in injecting or treating for other things. This is kind of like rule this out first before going down the road of figuring everything else out in the tree. And I have been called out to different cases of, well, we've treated oaks, for example, multiple rounds for oak wilt, for two-line chestnut borer, it's not responding. Well, did you do the thump test and check for armillaria first? And then bam, there it is. Well, that's why the other treatments are not responding is because this is the primary problem. It's literally at the root of the problem. So this is also, again, why I always start my diagnostic process from the base and work upwards with any tree. But armillaria is not the only thing at the base that could go wrong. You know, the number one preventable tree condition in urban areas is weed whip or mower damage. You know, go to any golf course or even almost any urban yard setting where there's turf, there will be chronic long-term injury from the mowing or weed whipping mechanical injury that has built up there. And it's also a really good talking point in support of putting mulch rings around trees if your client is inclined to do so. The farther out away from the trunk, the better. You know, it's as a general rule, I'd say start three feet out. And if you can get them to get rid of more turf than that, even better. And of course, not mulch volcanoes or doesn't need to be more than three to four inches deep. But a mulch ring goes a long way towards preventing this kind of damage. The other thing, when you're starting from the base and working your way up, you can establish where they're planting issues at the very beginning stage of this tree's life. Like, whereas it's set up to have stem girdling roots from being planted too deep. 
because that root flare, of course, I mean, it's much more widespread in knowledge and practice now, or it's getting out there more, that the root flare should be visible at the soil surface. This is my Hennepin Tech class from 2014, and we took a ball and burlap sugar maple and basically bare rooted it, just tore all the soil and burlap off from it to find where that flare was situated. It was actually about eight inches down within the ball. So then we've planted that tree and now it's a thriving sugar maple on campus. So symptoms of soil related problems in our urban settings could be any of these things above the tip dieback, early fall color, the yellowing from chlorosis or just general decline, kind of a broad description of the tree's not doing well, it's dying back, or if it looks like a telephone pole at the base. You know, this is all kind of by way of saying most urban tree problems are soil related. So that's another reason why you start at the base and work your way upwards. Like if you're working on improving soil conditions, then you're really being proactive as to why are these things showing up in the crown? You know, if you're just treating things in the crown, but not dealing with what led to them to show up in the first place, it's not gonna be a fundamental change to the situation. It'll keep recurring or you'll have less success. And when we consider this very idealized look at what uh, soil should be for trees, by volume, half of that soil should just be open space for air and water to move through it. And ideally 5% would be organic matter. And then that leaves less than 50% is the actual physical mineral content of the soil. And of course, what we get to deal with in our urban settings is very, very different from that. We get the compaction, the low organic matter, rock mulch, which invariably would have a black plastic underneath it. And here in this picture, the either a maple or a linden, looks like a telephone pole and you still have the nursery cord wrapped around it. So this is more of our workaday things that we run into as arborists. Or there's water logging too. You know, as part of your diagnostic process, you know, uh, you could do a percolation test where you dig a hole two feet deep or even one foot deep and fill it with water and see how long it takes to drain that out. That within 24 hours, it should be drained out. If it still has water pooled up in there 24 hours later, that's a big uh, point towards, you know, waterlogged soils could be a big part of why you're seeing continual decline in different trees on the site. And talk to the client about not applying irrigation at a rate faster than it can infiltrate through your soils there. And soil tests, they're also part of the diagnostic process. You can rely on sending a test to a lab. The soil tests don't tend to come back with frowning and smiley face stickers on them. That's my own little embellishment just to kind of highlight a couple of things on here. You know, as I noted, 5% organic matter would really be ideal, but we rarely, if ever, see that. And in this test, it's 0.8%, very low. So we get the frowny face on there. And noting also potassium being low. Now, potassium, when that's deficient, we can see a lot of conditions show up with trees, especially conifers that don't have the winter hardiness or the ability to manage the moisture in the needle tissue. And you get a lot of spring needle drop beyond what would be normal because potassium is a real key element in regulating water balance in tissues. And we tend to see a lot of soil tests around the Minneapolis St. Paul area, low in potassium. And then pH I have highlighted a little bit high at 7.3. There's parts of our Metro that are much higher than that. And then down in the lower line, a lot of the micronutrients being low, you know, so this could be taken care of with the right kind of fertilizer program with a, a couple of applications over a few seasons and just see how the trees respond to the results of the soil test, guiding what you're putting on for fertilization. 
you can also, you know, if you have an air spade or are interested in getting one, this is another reason to have it. Um, you can use it as a diagnostic tool. You know, use that forced air from the air spade to examine for stem girdling roots. I remember the days of having to do this with a trowel and a whisk broom. And once the air spade became available, I thought of it as like the next best thing to having x-ray vision. You know, it was almost science fiction how quickly and easily you could see what was below ground underneath the surface of where they're girdling roots. So you can end up with this kind of a view and then decide what to do next. That's a whole webinar unto itself is, okay, what do you do once you uncover this? How many of these things can you cut off? I will save that for another time maybe, but an air spade just considered as a diagnostic tool is very powerful. So, okay, we've looked at the root collar area, done our thump test, ruled out injury or infection, taken a look at what the soil conditions are. Now we can work our way up through the stem into the crown of the tree, not the other way around, you know, because otherwise we might end up getting false hopes of what's treatable. So work our way up through the stem into the crown. We can continue our thump test as high as we can reach on the stem because that might reveal some hidden cankers or other defects in there that are structural. You now these <clears throat> cankers on the stem of this old mature elm were initially covered over by bark that I found quite a bit. Like these are big cankers, like almost the size of a hubcap. But you can tell when you thump on them on the bark that was over it, that it just sounds mushy or hollow and peel that off and there's a huge canker in there. That's gonna to relate to top dieback because that's quite a bit of vascular conduction that's disrupted there. So the branches way out at the tips that were connected to this part of the root system below are not functional anymore. They're essentially severed, but that's also gonna make distribution of any injection of Arbitec to prevent Dutch elm disease potentially suspect too in how it's getting through the crown. So once we move up through the crown and we've examined the stem, then we can look for patterns and patterns will be associated with where are the symptoms located in the crown? Are we talking about distributed evenly throughout it? Are they on the interior or exterior of the crown? Are they just limited to one part of the crown and not spread around it? And what's the rate of their onset? Did this happen gradually or was it a rapid onset? It just happened really quickly, almost overnight. So each one of those factors will kind of give us a different picture to start looking at a pattern of what might be going on. So if, if you've got isolated, limited dieback to just one very specific piece of the crown, you know, look in this picture right below that red arrow, below that part of the ash that just looks bare, there's a big profusion of sprouts. It's like there's something disrupting the connection to the crown and there's a sprouting at that point in the stem, like then you check for a canker or a wound at that point. And there's a lot of canker fungi that can get in ash and other trees. So, you know, initially an arborist might say, well, why did the treatment fail? Why is this whole tree not green? It's not a case of the treatment failing because our treatments don't treat for cankers or wounds that happen from other things, mechanical wounding. Maybe there's, uh, you know, the good old homeowner cable device where they wrap a chain around there and it's girdled that piece off. So don't just be quick to assume your treatments are failing, like do the full diagnostics of the structure and the intactness of the bark and where our canker is located. And, you know, this clue of the sprouting just shows like the hormonal signal from the root system is still going up that used to activate that part of the crown and that's been shut off or disrupted somehow. So it is triggering a bunch of sprouts there, telling it to grow leaves. So what was it that caused that disruption? That's what we're gonna to try to establish. So a different pattern, if it's not 
just one specific part of the crown completely dead? Are you looking at just the lower interior shaded parts of the crown? That would be very consistent to a foliar fungal infection, just a leaf fungus kind of disease. You know, something like our oak anthracnose here that would show you some distorted necrotic foliage. And it's in that lower shaded interior where the fungus would grow more, but in the sunny upper wind ventilated and sun dried areas, that's where the fungus is not gonna be able to grow. So you'll see in these foliar fungi, either leaf spots or necrotic patches, just meaning dead tissue or distorted foliage where the dead patch just kind of stops growing and the rest of the leaf grows and it kind of curves around like that. And a lot of these in the foliar infections, the trees begin to grow a new set of leaves as the season dries out and there's enough energy budget to build a new set of leaves. That happens with quite a few of the oak and ash anthracnose kind of situations. Maybe your pattern is more of a slow decline from the top down as we're checking out rate of onset and distribution in the crown. So that could be any number of things or maybe all of them. Uh, could be a canker fungus like in this maple on the left, disrupting conduction to the top of the tree or borers are getting in there, eating through the phloem tissue and disrupting that kind of conduction or construction injury can show up as a slow decline. Might be all of those. Maybe construction injury set the stage for the canker to invade wounds and borers to come in to take out a stressed tree. Might be all of those. But then another pattern could be rapid decline and wilting from the top down. You know, in oaks, we first go towards oak wilt. Vascular disease, if the conductive tissue is plugged up by oak wilt fungus, well, then that rapid wilting is just water not getting fully conducted out to the ends of the branches. Or mechanical injury doing the same thing. Abiotic or non-living factors, some big blast of herbicide or salts off from roads or sidewalks that get leached into the soil at the end of a winter in snowy parts or after an ice storm. You know, in the spring, that stuff with irrigation or you're hosing off your sidewalk, it might rinse into the soil and get in and it's basically sucking water back out of the root system and it's gonna affect the tree as potentially a rapid wilt. Now here's where we get into signs versus symptoms. Uh, signs really is what we're after, after we establish a pattern of what's going on, what I've been talking about. A sign is, seeing the actual causal agent, in this case, European elm scale. The symptom is just what the pathogen or the pest is doing to the plant, like causing a wilting. So you could see here on this elm, well, there's yellowing spots on branches. And then the first concern always is Dutch elm disease. But collecting a sample points out, well, there are these scales on there and that's really, you know, they're pumping out the phloem and disrupting the, the twig to the point where that foliage is turning yellow. So really, this is to point out that symptoms are less definitive in diagnosis than signs, because you know, that wilting or flagging of DED, a variety of conditions can cause the same kinds of symptoms, like wilting could come from herbicide injury, wilting could come from a vascular disease. So if we can find a sign then it really points us to a more definitive end result of our diagnostic process. Because just wilting alone is too general. It gets us in the ballpark, but it's not definitive. So in a lot of these cases to determine, you know, well, is it Dutch elm disease? Is it European elm scale, for example? Up, extending your reach with pole tools will be a good thing, whether it's a pole saw or a lopper. I mean, I like to have them as separate tools. Some of the hardware stores sell them as combined tools, but I think they get too bulky and clumsy to get into tight spots where you need to reach to get a sample. And most of your real reputable arborist supply places will sell them as separate components and you can easily pop them off from the 
ends of a ferrule, you know, that are uh, your extensions that you can clip together on them. So you probably have these already as an arborist, but you know, allows you to extend your reach part of your diagnostic kit. And there's an art to uh, knowing where to collect the samples. Uh, if you can find the place that's the transition between live and dead tissue on that sample, like not collecting just out on the end of a dead branch, that won't tell you much because it's dried out. It's hard to carve into. Probably secondary fungi might already be invading in there that kind of cloud the picture of what you're looking for. If you're too close in where there's not any affected tissue, the pathogen might not be there. But you can see in this picture from a bur oak that I collected, it's right at that transition line between live and dead even so much so that there's kind of a compartmentalization line shown there that runs diagonally there, right above the knife tip. And then I've got that staining streaking from the oak wilt that I was suspecting in this case. And once you've got your sample collected from the right spot, um, knowing where to look for the signs is important. Like if you're checking for a bore, or say it's two line chestnut bore in this oak, recognizing the biology of what the creature is after. They're a phloem feeding insect. So you take your good sharp knife and slice down just into the phloem layer below the bark. That's where you see the stained tissue, the meandering tunnel right in the phloem there. And that's that tip off. But if you're suspecting oak wilt, for example, then it's a vascular fungus and you know that's gonna be in xylem tissue. So you have to go a layer deeper than the phloem to find that. And since it stays in a line consistent with those sapwood vessels where that infection is occurring, you'll see that reflected as just a long, long streak that it's not meandering like a phloem feeding insect. So here on that same sample, where you can see that compartmentalization line, to the right and left, there's that lighter phloem layer. I'm down below that into the xylem, and that's where the oak wilt is showing up. So this is a, just an example of you know the biology of the condition you're looking for, and that will inform your diagnostic process. And then eventually that informs your knowledge of how to manage the disease as well. And an important point too I've come across over time is don't stop at the first thing you find. And I'd call it co-occurring factors. It just means more than one thing at a time in the same tree. You know, if we um, just stopped as we got into the phloem and found the chestnut borer, the phloem feeding borer and treated for that, well, then the tree continues to die back after multiple treatments. Why was that? Well, it was the oak wilt that was undiagnosed in there. And just go another layer deeper and verify, you know, here in the same sample, I've got both things going on. So, you know, you, you know, hooray, Congratulations, you found something that you can pin down like two line chestnut bore. Doesn't mean other things are not going on at the same time. So be thorough in examination of your sample. And a lot of times you might have to make use of a laboratory, you know, from a university or a government source or even private labs where they can grind up your sample and send it into, you know, put it into a Petri dish and culture out and find out what fungus it is, verify. You know, we do this a lot for Dutch elm disease, oak wilt, sometimes verticillium wilt or other things. And this comes back to the right sample. You know, if it's a completely dead limb and those in an advanced state of decline, they can't use those to isolate disease and culture it on a Petri dish. Uh, what they're looking for is something that's at that transition line where they could get the fungus out of it and actually grow it out to verify the presence of it. And the recommendations for most labs, yeah, symptomatic limbs at 3.75 centimeters, that's inch and a half to two inch diameter and six inches long. I'm into the metric system, as you can tell, but this basically just means inch and a half to two inch diameter six inches long with some leaf tissue from the sampled limbs is always good. That helps the lab staff get an idea of what's going on too. And 
just think of it as a living thing that you're dealing with because it is you know you put it in a plastic bag in an ice chest and get it to the lab as soon as you can shipping it by courier or overnight mail a lot of times i would just bring the samples directly to our university of minnesota lab to hand off in person but in the era of covid that's not really something they're doing anymore but whatever you can do to get it there as soon as you can early in the week so it can be processed that week like don't just leave it in your car on a friday in july and it heats up and cooks kills off the fungus in there and then you get a false negative for that tree because of that the sample dried out or got too hot or whatever so just think of it as a living creature and you have to keep it alive in a cool place for a while before it gets to the lab so if we just quickly review basic diagnostic tools, it's probably stuff you already have, like a, a rubber mallet, if you don't have it, 10 bucks at a hardware store. And even if you don't wanna get that, a pocket knife, everyone should have a pocket knife on them for all sorts of purposes, for whittling into your samples to check for things, or even just the back end of the handle for doing your thump test. And pole saw and lopper, arborists already have that. So I didn't even get into uh, magnifying lenses or stuff like that. That's something in a further iteration of the diagnostic series, we can get into that like for summer and fall. Uh, I put air spade into this presentation. If you have that already, it's great. You know, I consider it a diagnostic tool just as much as a therapeutic tool for treating compacted urban soils. So we can wrap it up here with uh, the review. Systematic approach to diagnostics. If you start from the base and work your way up through the tree, it just takes a lot of uh, kind of fear and guesswork out of the process if you know you're gonna move through every site the same way. And knowing really solid tree identification is important because it can be tricky. You can go down a completely wrong alley if you don't have the identification of the tree nailed down at the beginning. and once you have started from the base and worked your way upwards, then it's all about looking for patterns in the crown. Like what's the distribution, the rate of onset of the patterns of what you're seeing, and then trying to get at a sign versus a symptom. Because the symptoms are just parts of those patterns that get you into the ballpark of some different conditions. But a sign is the actual observable indicator of the organism that you suspect. So if you just start putting this into practice, I hope it will really kind of ease some worries and make you more effective at what you're doing. And it's just fun to expand your skill set and knowledge as a practitioner too. So thanks for your time and attention. And I hope this is helpful.